Hey, this is Off the Cuff, and I'm Steve from TorahFamily.org. In Matthew 13, we see Yeshua give several parables regarding the kingdom of heaven. Now, the topic of the kingdom can be a little confusing. I mean, the Pharisees asked Yeshua when the kingdom will come in Luke 17. Since they were asking when it would come, it obviously wasn't there then, correct? Yeshua then replied that it wouldn't come by observation. He said it's within us. However, the funny thing is, right after he says this to the Pharisees, the next verse shows him immediately turning to his disciples and telling them how all will see him when he comes to set up his rule in the kingdom. So his day of ruling and reigning kicks off in a way that everyone will see when he comes. However, only those who have the kingdom in their heart will be the ones who partake in it. That's why we're to love Yahweh with all our heart, soul, and strength, with all you desire, all you think and feel, and all you do. The kingdom will start with the new covenant and Yeshua being with his bride at Mount Sinai for one year. It'll be just how it happened out of Egypt. He was with them for one year. History truly is cyclical. Then he sets out to conquer after the year is up. This topic and those surrounding it is covered in all of these teachings. Remember, David was anointed king while Saul was still ruling. When David was anointed, he went to the wilderness while Saul was in the city. This is how it will be in the end. Yeshua will be anointed as king, but will be with his bride in the wilderness while the Antichrist is ruling in the city. So, when the kingdom comes, it won't be observed by all. It will only be observed by those who have it in their heart. That's why Yeshua turned to his disciples to tell them what would happen. His return will initially be seen by all, but only those of his bride will observe and partake in the kingdom right away at the marriage covenant. The five wise virgins go in. The five foolish don't. So, what does this tell us? It tells us the kingdom doesn't come until Yeshua comes to be with his bride. The time when Yeshua brings the two sticks of Ephraim and Judah back together, as noted in Ezekiel 37. This is the same chapter that discusses the dry bones coming to life, that being the resurrection. Now, regarding the two sticks coming together, remember, Yeshua said a kingdom that's divided can't stand. And right now, his kingdom is divided. The northern and southern kingdom have never come back together since they split under Jeroboam after Solomon. But when he comes to be with his bride for one year, he unites the kingdom back together. Thus, the 144,000 bringing all 12 tribes back together under him. And as noted in our Church of Philadelphia teaching, the 144,000 are the army that rides with Yeshua. Please notice that Ezekiel said the dry bones that was resurrected was a vast army. And they are noted as the whole house of Israel. Thus, all 12 tribes are represented together as one again. The 144,000 are the first fruits of the kingdom coming back together, the beginning of the whole kingdom being united together again. In fact, it's in Revelation 12 that we see exactly when the kingdom comes. This is the time when his kingdom begins. And please remember, this verse is right after we see the birth of the male child, a reference to Isaiah 66, where we see the Son represents the children, plural. Something also discussed in Romans chapter 8, all pointing to the first resurrection. So it seems the kingdom will be something mysterious to those who don't have it within. 
they won't be able to partake in it, at least not in the element of the bride and the leadership that he establishes for it, that being the first fruits of the 144,000. But again, in Matthew 13, we see Yeshua give several parables regarding the kingdom. It's the parable that is commonly referred to as the wheat and the tares that we want to look at today. You'll see many people take this parable and use it to say the first resurrection takes place at the end of the tribulation instead of before it. So, let's examine this parable and see what it says. Matthew 13, starting in verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then, six verses later, we see the explanation. Matthew 13, verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin in all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. This parable is discussing the removal of all who don't choose to follow the ways of Yahweh in the kingdom. It even says in verse 41 that Yeshua sends angels to weed out of his kingdom all who sin and do evil. And remember, 1 John 3, 4 tells us that sin is breaking God's eternal law. And to understand just who Yahweh considers evil, please see our teaching, evil people. But the point here is that they are weeding out of the kingdom. So, this isn't discussing an event at the beginning of Yeshua's reign or an event before his reign begins. It's discussing what happens at the end of the millennium. He let the weeds grow together with the wheat during his reign in the kingdom. So, will there be sin and people who disobey during the millennium? During his kingdom reign? Yes, not nearly what we see today, but it'll be there. This is seen in Ezekiel 14. These people will sin because of their own willful disobedience. However, all will have their time of temptation when Satan is loosed at the end of the millennium. While it's hard to imagine, the scriptures seem to imply there will be many who will be deceived by him. This is at the end of the millennium, the time when Yeshua cleans out his kingdom of all who choose to practice evil. There are some who tried to apply this Gog and Magog in Revelation 20 to that which is in Ezekiel 39. However, Ezekiel 39 shows a battle takes place and people will use their weapons as fuel for seven years after this battle. 
and it shows that all the dead bodies will be buried. But when we look at Revelation 20, there's no battle here, and no one is buried. It simply says that fire comes down from heaven and devours them all. This implies that Gog is a title, like president, and not a name. This is important to note because the prophet Hosea shows there will be no more war after the battle of Armageddon. But it's in these verses of Revelation chapter 20 that we see what Yeshua was talking about in Matthew 13. Let's read verses 40 through 43 again. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. So here we see the weeds are pulled up at the end. So what's the parallel? Satan goes and deceives the many. They rebel and are then removed. They come together against Yeshua at Jerusalem. Then they're consumed by the fire from heaven and sent to hell. After that will be the second resurrection just before the great white throne judgment, as noted in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Now, verse 43 in Matthew 13 shows how the righteous inherit the earth. All the wicked are removed, and the righteous will live forever in Yahweh's eternal kingdom. This is exactly what takes place in Revelation 21 with the new heavens and new earth. When discussing how the evil one plants the weeds, the question often comes up, how can the evil one plant the weeds when he's locked away? But it must be understood that it doesn't say when he plants them. There will be many who survive the tribulation and enter the kingdom age through the second exodus, as noted in Isaiah 66. While most will be believers, there's nothing to say that they all will be. Actually, this will be a time very similar to when the Hebrews left Egypt. There were many others who left Egypt to go to the promised land with them. So it could be the exact same at the end of the tribulation at the time of the second exodus, giving more reason to see how history is indeed cyclical. The bottom line is, this parable of the wheat and the tares is one that describes what takes place at the end of the millennium. It's not an event that takes place before it. Well, that's all I have. Think about it. Pray about it. But more than anything, Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Until next time, Shalom.